Everyone, welcome to the next episode of Style with Den. Let me tell you something, okay? This is building. It's got a lot of momentum happening. And I said, every time I revisit and check in with you, I'm gonna go stronger, harder, bigger, just on all levels. And today I have delivered and then some. I am sitting here in Sean John, just came from the Empire State Building, and sitting with a man who is still granting wishes several months removed from his Tony award-winning performance as the genie in Aladdin and who now is in the biggest hit on the planet, Hamilton, is sitting here talking with style with Den. So I want to welcome, with so much pride, joy, and just gratitude, James Monroe Iglehart. Welcome, my friend. And I'm so glad to be here. You have no idea. It's unbelievable. First of all, I got to say, you look spectacular. Listen, uh, I have to thank you for that. Oh, um, I had just a I little part have, in that. I also have to thank Sean John. Thank you very much. I had so much fun. First of all, I was at my favorite building in the entire world. I am at the Empire State Building. And to go up there and to be in the showroom of Sean John and see all the looks and see all the fashion styles. I just said, I was a kid in the candy store, man. I really was. Ooh, they are not playing. We just came from the Empire State Building. We've thrown down several looks. We gave him the velour tracksuit moment. Yep. We gave you that denim with the decal. Yes. I mean, and now we are giving you this suit head to toe. You Thank really you are much. looking fantastic. Thank you. I mean, it's unbelievable. I was sitting at my computer and I'm thinking, who is on my wish list of people that I want to talk to? Who do, and I mean, Clearly, I've known about you and, and all of the success. I mean, you as the genie in Aladdin, which we're going to talk about, is just mind-blowing. Unreal. You. And I was on YouTube, and I'm there, and, and I, it popped up this performance of you uh, in Friend Like Me, and I watched it. And I said, you know what? I'm going to write this man, and I'm going to reach out, and I want to bring him into my world. And I did, and I wrote it, and I, and I sent that email, and I forgot about it for a bit. And then you were just open and you were here and you said, yeah, man, I'm gonna do this. Of course. And I said, I popped out there to the people out of Global Brands Group and I said, let's get this guy in the best. And Sean John came through big time. I mean, listen, to be, to be sitting here with you talking and to uh, be able to wear you know, the threads of Sean John, it's a blessing and it's awesome. And it's, it's, a, you know, it's a dream come true, to be perfectly honest. Uh, I always have the hashtag, uh, you know, work, dream big, work hard, work hard, yes. dream big. And then to go into Sean, Sean John's uh, you know, showroom and they have hats with Dream Big on it. And I was like, okay, this was meant to be. Because when you, know, when you, when you want to do this business and when you want to be around this style of, of work as far as entertainment, it does take a very large dream and it takes a very big heart and you have to have a very thick skin. Ooh. And so it doesn't matter. I guess you know, in entertainment, which is you know, part of whether you're interviewing somebody or whether you're doing fashion, you just have to be able to look beyond the walls that this world puts on you and say, okay, I'm going to break out of the wall and do something different. And to, it starts with a dream and it starts with a big one. And when I looked around in that showroom and I, while I'm putting on the clothes that you had laid out and I was thinking about where I'd come from and what I've been doing with my life and like where I was when I was 17, I was like the 17 year old me was losing his mind. Oh. Cause I used to see all the brothers wearing all the cool fashion. And yes. I remember being in the Bay Area when Biggie and Diddy and all those guys came out and I was like, man, that'd be really cool to wear Jordans. I'd be really cool to wear Sean John, this and that. And then here we are yeah. all these years later and I'm sitting here in a beautiful Sean John suit sit, talking to you. So this is pretty cool. It's unbelievable. I mean, it's a realization of a dream on many fronts as it is for me right now sitting here with you. I want to go back cool. first. I want to go back to James as a young, young lad. <laughs> I want to go, what was that first time for you where you had that spark where you said, okay, I like being up in front of people. I, I, I can make people laugh. They're responding to me. Where did that, that first moment happen for you? I was four years old. Four. I was four years old at Palmasia Baptist Church in Hayward, California, Damn. and I had my first solo in the Sunshine Choir. Ooh. And uh, what did you remember, sing? Uh, I think, actually, no, it wasn't Sunshine Choir. It was actually, uh, no, it was Sunshine Choir. Sorry, I think it was This Little Light of Mine. I sang, and then a couple years later, um, maybe like two or three years later, uh, Palmasia Baptist Church had opened a school, so mm. Palmasia School, and there were only, I think, like maybe six or seven of us, no, about nine of us that went to the school. And uh, our parents wanted to do something different. And our teacher there, Miss Dopart, wanted to do a presentation to let this church know what we had been doing. Okay. And uh, we did a concert, and I sang a song called Bullfrogs and Butterflies. Ooh, okay. And I am telling you, I heard <laughs> there was a singer at our church named Carl who was trying to imitate a legendary singer named 
the Reverend James Cleveland. And so I was imitating Carl, imitating James Cleveland. So there was this growl I was using as a kid. And there I was out there, maybe seven years old, singing, and the crowd goes nuts. And I heard those applause. It was the second time I heard it. Once at four, second at seven. I was like, you know what? That's it. That's this it, applause John. thing that's happening, I want to hear this every day of my life. <laughs> so every chance I got to be on stage or in front of people, I've, I've done my best to do that. Wow, that's, that's unbelievable. And when, when was it for you where you said, okay, I love to be on stage, I love performing, and now I'm thinking about doing this as a career, potentially? Um, in this capacity of musical theater, that didn't hit me until probably college. And okay. the reason why is because I had gone through different iterations of what I wanted to do. Everything was in front of people. Everything. <laughs> uh, I wanted to be a Harlem Globetrotter, and I realized I had no basketball skills. I wanted to be uh, a, a professional wrestler, and I still love professional wrestling to this day. I know uh, you do. And I, right, and I saw a guy, you know, I saw a brother get hit with a chair, and I was like, that looks real. Maybe I don't want to do that. <laughs> And I wanted to be a rapper, so as, at 10 years old, I started rapping. I've been freestyle rapping for 33 years, Damn. which is crazy to say. And um, I thought that was gonna happen, but then I got to high school, I went to show choir uh, of the teacher named Mr. Rowden, and I got more into musical theater. I was always into musical theater because my parents always took me when I was a kid. My first show I ever saw was The Wiz. But it wasn't until college when I did my first like real musical. I did Oklahoma, of all things. <laughs> um, and I was like, you know what? <laughs> Let me just, when I, when I sat back and thought about it, I was like, this combines everything I like to do, music, dance, and acting. I said, let me do that. And I switched majors from music to theater, and uh, I've been doing it ever since. Now, so you get out, you, you, you have your degree, and yes. you, you're out. Now, you were in California, right? Oh, That's yes. That's where you were based. Mm -hmm. And you went out there and you started auditioning. Now, how was that initial reception when you went out there with, with casting directors? Did you start working right away? No, was, the, fun, the fun that, thing, that, um, I, I was blessed really early. What happened was I was a junior, I, I was um, gonna direct my senior project, mm -hmm. and my senior project was gonna be Eight Misbehaven. And I figured I should try to f study as much as I can about this thing before I direct it, because as every director does. But when you're, you know, that, that seems like such a normal thing to think as a director, but when you're young, you're like, I should do something to yes. make sure I know what I'm doing. You're like, yeah, dummy, of course you should. <laughs> but there was a local theater uh, around the corner from where I lived that was actually doing Ain't Misbehaving, a 99-seat theater wow. that was doing Ain't Misbehaving, and I auditioned. And uh, they liked me and I got to play the Ken Page role. From there I met a guy who said, hey, they're doing Five Guys Named Mo in Oregon this summer. So I told my teachers in school, look, I'm not gonna do the summer musical. I'm gonna go to Oregon for a whole summer and do the show. And I made, what was it, $300 a week. I was Ooh, making big money. I was okay. able to buy Big Macs and fries. I was like, I am living. <laughs> $300 a week, yeah. you can't tell me nothing. Mm. And when I got back to college um, that next, that next uh, semester, um, this crazy audition came up for um, a tour of, um, what was it? It was Showboat, Phantom of the Opera, and Ragtime. Ooh. And I auditioned and got a, a swing position in the uh, tour of Showboat. That's how I became, in the, that's how I got in the union, and that's how I got my first major show before anything else had happened. So I did this, this little show in San Leandro, this show in Ashland, Oregon, and from there, I did this, made this crazy audition, and it was an open call. It was a cattle call. Wow. And I went and became a swing, and I graduated early and went on tour for six months, and that's how the career started. And I stayed in the Bay Area for eight years just doing regional theater. Mm -hmm. I didn't have an agent until um, I didn't have an agent until, this, until after we won the Tony in Memphis. Oh my goodness, look at that. I had I negotiated uh, my contract for Spelling Bee and I saw I was on Broadway before. <laughs> um, look at I didn't you, if this theater thing ever doesn't work out, well, you yeah. got another gig, right? Maybe, mm -hmm. you know. Oh, we're not gonna have to worry about that anytime <laughs> soon. That's unbelievable. Yeah. Um, and, and your first uh, Broadway show you did was Spelling Bee, correct? Yes, it was. Tell yes. me about how that was when you got that call. Okay, now that again is another story. I had done Memphis uh, locally at, um, in the Bay Area. Yes. And they had brought to the Bay Area Montego Glover, Tony nominee, Chad Kimball, Tony nominee, um, <laughs> uh, Jay Bernard Calloway, who has been in everything in the world, and my best friend, uh, one of my best friends, Derek Baskin. So Derek Baskin, who plays Gator in the show, he and Jay are out, uh, I can tell the story now because <laughs> we're so far removed, they are out with uh, David Bryan and uh, they're talking about doing Memphis and everything. And then uh, Derek tells, calls me and says, yeah, man, I got cast in Spelling Bee. And I was like, what is this? He's, oh, it's a brand new show, man. It's going to Broadway. I was like, oh, cool. They go to Broadway. I'm still regional. They decide that they're going to do a Spelling Bee in um, San Francisco. Okay. They can't find anybody. 
Derek says, hey, why don't you call my boy James? He lives out there. They called me and I went, I auditioned. And when I got to the audition, they were like, Derek says you're great. No pressure, just New, <laughs> just right, New, just right. New York people. <laughs> I auditioned, they liked me, they fly me to New York to audition and I'm thinking my audition's for some casting director. No, it is for William Finn and Whoa. James Lapine. Woo. I go in the room, I audition, they like me. Next thing I know, they say, hey, you're in. And our cast went from San Francisco to Boston and then we replaced the Broadway cast on Broadway. That's how I got to my first Broadway show. But again, most of the shows I've gotten have been um, referrals from people. Friends have told directors or friends have told people about me and said, hey, you should look at this guy, he's really good. So when they say, be nice in this business, oh. it really pays. You know, that's something really I, I, as, as a teacher, I would tell my students, you know, some of them would be some of the most talented ones in the world and they'd be difficult in class. And I said, look, it don't matter if you are the best thing since sliced bread. If you are not gonna show up with a good attitude and get it done, then yes. people are not gonna wanna work with you. And also, you know, it, it, you, can, you, can, you can be the best singer in the world, but if you have a bad attitude, mm -hmm. they'd rather go with the person who's not as good, but they can work with. Because the audience just wants a good performance. Absolutely. You don't have to be Oscar award winning. You just have to just tell the story and present the material in an entertaining way. Absolutely. So, you know, it's that's true. What I Can you tell me uh, about uh, how you dealt with hearing the word no at times in your life, whether it be oh. pertaining to your career, how do you, how do you respond to that or, or, or take it in? And, and I think you just have to learn to have a thick skin. I think there's no easy answer for that. I think when someone says no, you have two responses. You can go, okay, no, this isn't for me. Or, all right, they said no. I'm gonna do something so that the next time they see me, they say yes. <laughs> oh, I like that. I'm gonna take that so, one Because there's, some, there's sometimes you go, sometimes when you hear no, you don't understand. Mm -hmm. And for me, everybody doesn't believe this, but for me, sometimes I realize, oh, maybe that's not what God had for me. Maybe yes. that's a door that's closed. And, and then you look back after it happens, you go, ooh, I've dodged a bullet on that one. I'm so glad they said no. I, I thought I wanted it. Oh, I wanted that show. I won't say specifically. There was a show I wanted so badly. Yes. Oh, I wanted yes. it badly. Well, I've been there. And I auditioned, and they said no, and I was, oh, I was so mad. I told my wife, I was like, how dare they? Yes. They know how good I am. Yes. And I saw that show, I was like, whoo, who dodged the bullet? Thank <laughs> you, Lord. I am not in this one. Because I sat back and was like, oh, this is awful. Yeah. Yep, I wasn't supposed to be here. <laughs> Thank you for the no. Yes. So sometimes when you hear no, it's either, okay, I accept that, or you know what? Good, you said no, but I'm gonna do something else that's gonna make you call me back, which I have done. They've said no, I've gone to another project, I'm like, oh, would you come back and read for this? Like, oh, now you wanna see me. Yeah, I thought you would. Yeah, absolutely. Because you had, you had, a, you had a, a thought, what you thought I was, and that's not who, you, that's you know, not who I truly am. I was. found a, a way in my life that sometimes when I hear no, I use it to motivate me. Thank you. Exactly, you yes. know, it's just you come back stronger, just like you said, and, and harder. And like you said, no's happen for a reason. Yes, sometimes. Sometimes I've got a no, and then something else pops along that if that was a yes, that wouldn't happen, and that's right. better and yes. bigger and where I'm supposed to be. There's a path for you, and your yeah. path is not everybody else's path. And I think when you're in entertainment, we get so caught up in everybody else's journey. Mm. Oh man. So You're I'm watching preaching. I'm watching Din. And I'm like, wow, you know, Din got a show. <laughs> He's got working with fashion, working with Sean John and Juicy Couture. I want to do that. And it's like, dude, that's not your path. Yeah. That's Din's path. That path was made for Din. Those doors opened because that's for Din. Stop following Din's path and follow your path. Well, how do I know what my path is? You won't know unless you go out there and get on it. And once you get on it, that's when doors start opening and you start going, oh, well, this fits right with me. Well, yeah, because it's for you. There's a path for you, so follow it. If you spend your time, if, you, if people would put blinders on and just be focused on what they're supposed to be doing, just focused on you have a dream, focus on that dream. Don't focus on your dream and go, oh, but wait, he's doing something. Don't, 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 don't no. worry about what he's doing. You do your thing and you never know. Your dream, your past may meet up because as you can see, as you know, there's always a moment in entertainment where you're doing one thing and then some other body, some other says, hey man, uh, do you sing or do uh -huh. you model? You're like, oh, yeah. no, I don't model. Look at me, do I look like a model to you? <laughs> yeah, but we like to do something with bigger people. Next yeah. thing you know, and that's because you stayed focused on your path, but you got big enough that they would want to put you in other genres. So stay focused on your path and other things will come from that. Absolutely, you know, everybody has their own time and also moments when they, they peak, so to speak. It yes. is. I also uh, try to allow myself to stay open. Sometimes with those horse blinders, I said, this is the goal, I have to be here and do this, but sometimes you can miss other opportunities that is true. That is true. Th th there, there is true, there is a moment, there is a, there, you, can't be, uh, you can't be too stringent on it to where yes. you're so, so, you know, 
so narrow minded where you're like, that's all I see. You do have to be a little loose with it as my, as, uh, as my father got it from the legendary Bruce Lee. You can't be like ice, you have to be like water. Yes. You know, water is, water's, you know, strong and going on a path, but it's also very fluid and can go different ways. So yes, yeah, stay on your path, but if there's an opening for something else, yeah, take it, go right, why not? Well, this man, he clearly stayed on his path and that led to your Tony Award winning role as the genie in Aladdin. I mean, it's, 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 it's mind blowing. What I love, I've heard, I've heard you uh, speak about this before and I, and I really want to just dive in a little bit about that audition process for you about how you had to separate the iconic performance of Robin Williams and make it your own and to go in there and to be fearless and to say, I'm going to give it, whether it's going to work or it's not, yeah. but I'm going to do it this way. You know, the funny thing was, um, I have studied, I have a, I am a huge fan of stand-up comedians. That's the other thing I watch besides professional wrestling. I love stand-up comedians. I love comedy. I love making people laugh, making people smile. That's one of my favorite things to do. And so I had studied Robin and also had studied the, the, the movie Aladdin, I mm. knew it by heart. Oh, I mean, I knew it that. by heart. Yes. It came out when I was 17. So I had the VHS, I had the tape, I had the CD, I had the yes. DVD, and the Blu-ray. And the Blu-ray is something special because I'm on it now, which is crazy. Woo. But I had all of the different Dream variations. Big. Thank you. All the different variations <laughs> of Aladdin. And so I knew the character, but I also knew the challenge of, you know, this is not just some voice actor. This is Robin Williams. Mm -hmm. But I said, okay. I can't worry about that. I want this role. I want them to see me. So what do I have to do to, to do this? So I just went in fearless and started writing my own things. I knew that Robin improv, so I improv in the audition and I wrote my own jokes and the, hopefully they dug them. And you know, it's one of those moments where you have to take a chance. You say, take a chance, yes. throw it all on the table. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, you learn from it. Absolutely. Um, this one just happened to, to work. And Casey loved what he saw. And um, I became the genie and they let me have so much fun. And then when I got into the show, the legendary Jonathan Freeman, mm. voice of Jafar, only the mm. voice of Jafar. Woo! If you ever hear the voice of Jafar in, in English, it's Jonathan Freeman, whether it be at the parks, whether it be on video games, whether it be in cartoons, it's always it Jonathan. Is. He looks at me and he says, you realize that, um, you know, the genie wasn't always supposed to be Robin. And I said, what do you mean? And then uh, he said, you should talk to Alan about it. And I spoke to, of course, name dropping, the legendary, you know, uh, <laughs> Alan Menken. And Alan told me that they originally wanted the genie to be a uh, Cab Calloway type. So that's why when you listen to genie's music in the movie, it's all big band. It was supposed to be cotton clubby. And once they said that, that's when my, uh, that's when I kind of rested and said, okay, I don't have to do whatever Robin did. Because one, as a comedian and as a rapper, you don't bite off people's style. Yes. You do your own style. So but I want to be genie-esque, because the genie's character is a certain way. But I knew I could bring my style and my swagger and my craziness to the genie character and make a different version. And hopefully people would dig it. And trust me, I was nervous as I don't know what. When we were in Toronto, I was so scared. I didn't know what to do. <laughs> but I was like, I was going to trust that they were going to... Every, every time I did it in rehearsal, people laughed. So we went out there and we did it. And it's... I can't take credit for everything. Um, Casey Nicola was wonderful. Um, our, our wonderful writers, our producers, um, uh, my friend Brian Gonzalez helped me a lot, uh, out a lot, and of course, then just just the fans yeah. and and Disney itself, where we're so 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 awesome on on wow. allowing me to be and my cast. I mean, between Adam Jacobs and Courtney Reed and um, you know Jonathan Freeman and just the ensemble of Aladdin, they allowed me to create this character. They just went along with it. Whenever I did something, they were like, "Sure, we'll go with you." And I was like, "Nuts!" And you went on to do over a thousand performances. Yes. Unbelievable. Yeah. Now tell me real quick, when you heard your name as a Tony <laughs> Award winner, woo, tell me. It was very surreal because I didn't have time to think because quickly I'll tell you, uh, yeah. got to the Tony Awards, well, early in the morning, you get there early in the morning, you do a rehearsal in costume and everything. Then take all that mess off, take all the, then take a nap and do your show. We do it, we do a matinee. Uh. Then take all that stuff out again and do the red carpet. Do the red carpet. I'm about to sit next to my wife. Someone grabs me and goes, no, you can't. We're about to perform. They take me backstage. They put all the makeup stuff back on. That's my third time with oh. the makeup on. Oh makeup God. on, glitter on, <laughs> suit on, get on. Uh, uh, Lucy Lou announces us. We go out there. We do friend like me. I take all the stuff off. I run back. I sit next to my wife and that was my category. They called me. I get up, so I don't have time to be nervous. I, just, I go up there and I just go, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, praise God, and I leave. 
Then I'm gone doing interviews for an hour, and I finally come back and sit with Dawn with this Tony in my hand, and I finally have a time to process it all in. And I was like, the first thing I thought of is, I've missed all the Tonys. <laughs> I have dreamed of sitting in this chair you. You to, sit to watch, watch the Tonys, and I have missed two hours of a three-hour show, so I got to watch the last hour of the Tonys live, and I watched the rest of the Tonys the way I always do at home in my house. Oh, I was like, man. really? But it was the most surreal, amazing thing to be able to stand up there at Radio City and look out into the audience and, one, see this beautiful woman who has supported me my entire life, pretty much. Mm. Um, I'm 43 years old, and we've been, to, we've been married 15 years, but we've been together 19, and we've known each other 27. Oh my gosh. I've known her since she was 14, when I was 16 years old. And to see her there with me, and she's been with me through this whole process of life, of she saw me grow from a teenager to a man. And here I am on stage, and I look out, and I see the company that I always wanted to work for. I always wanted to work for Disney since my first time my parents took me to see Jungle Book at the, at the drive-in. Mm. And then I look around and I see colleagues that I came up in this business with. I see Josh Henry, who's one of the baddest performers in the world. He was in the same category. He's standing up. I see Audrey McDonald. I see Norm Lewis. I see all these amazing people that I have idolized. And all I can think of is what a blessing this is. And it didn't feel the way I thought it would feel. Like in college, you go, oh, I hope I yeah. win a Tony someday. Yeah. All I could feel was nothing but gratitude because there was no reason for me to be honored like that. So that I was one of the lucky ones. And the fact that I got it, all I can do is just praise and say thank you. And I thank those folks who helped me get to where I am because it's not an overnight success. It was the coolest 12-year overnight success ever. <laughs> And it was, the, it was also, what I just felt honored to get an award that my heroes, Ted Ross had won for The Wiz and Chuck Cooper had won for The Life. So I was in a line of guys that I had looked up to in the featured category to win. And it was just the coolest thing It was thing all about two and that, that acceptance speech. And you gave Baby, me that dance. Ooh, I, I guess, was like, just What's funny is I remember when I was a kid in church and people would get up and they would say, you know, what has God done for you? this week, and someone would get up and say something as simple as, you know, he put food on my table, and they would start dancing. And in that moment, I didn't have anything else to say, I won't get emotional, but I didn't have anything else to say. But I thought about being four and singing in church, and seven and singing Bullfrogs and Butterflies in high school, and all those dumb bullies who would say, yo man, why are you singing that white music? <laughs> You know, and then college, and then being in the real world where you're looking around, people say no to you all the time, and here I am yes. at Radio City Music Hall, at the pinnacle of Broadway theater, I couldn't do anything but give praise. That was it. That was, there was sometimes when you have, when people say musical theater, what mm. makes musical theater musical theater? The character gets to a point where they, can do any, they can't do anything but burst out into song but, or burst yes, out into dance. Yes. That was real life. Oh, that was real life for me. And we just sat back and kicked it. And then, like I said in the interview, we got mad real again. I said, I don't, want to, I, don't want this, I don't want me to feel like, well, this is my life now. So the first thing my wife did after we left the ra Radio City was go to McDonald's. Ooh, oh, oh yep. yeah. We went, I went to McDonald's in my suit, yes. hold my Tony, got a Big Mac, got back in the car, went back to Jersey. That's exactly how it was. And it, it was the coolest thing ever. Oh, man, living the dream. So you had mentioned that you've been rapping for 33 years. <laughs> Ooh, yes. And yeah, yeah. you... Uh, are also part of an incredible group, the yes. Freestyle Love Supreme. Exactly. You yes, guys yeah. are not playing around. We don't. We, what's funny is we do, but we aren't. We, yeah. we have so much fun, but when, we, when we're up there, it's, it's all fun, but it's all business. Well, I mean, it is serious in the fact that you guys can, on the moment, take in these, someone can throw out some subjects to you, and you just freestyle and flow, and it is just sick. And so, you know what? I'm not going to have James Monroe <laughs> Igohart sitting here on my show, okay, on the Style with Den show, and he is not going to give me some rhymes. So, if you don't mind, my friend, i got to put you on the spot a no little problem, bit. No problem, no problem. And I'm going to need for you to throw in some Sean John. All right. Some Diddy. Got it. And some Style with Den. Got you. All right. Do you need a beat from me or something? No, I'm cool. You good? You good? I'm good. I'm good. All right. So when you when you when you ready, man? So let me see. 
So it's a Tuesday afternoon and I'm jamming on this groove because I want to get down and always look smooth. So who do I get a call from? Homeboy Dennis. He says, yo, get down here because you got to get with us. And who do I have? Yo, I got it straight going on at the Empire State Building with Sean John. You're going to be down. You're going to be straight fitty. Yo, you're going to be looking as fly as that boy Diddy. You're going to be coming through with nigga on my show. And then you're going to be kicking it with style with Dan as we are kicking here, sitting here looking all fly and everybody trying to be these two guys they want to be dead they want to be james but they can't get down because it's can't get with this game now when i look at you what do i see i see your brother who's always fly every day g you came back from teaching to dancing didn't have your own show no prancing coming through in the suits because you always look cute and then you got the big brown boy to boot Ooh. put me in a cool old sean john suit sitting back looking back kicking because that's what we do so what we gonna do have to say it again dennis and James kicking on style with Dan. Oh man, killing it. That's what I'm talking about. That is how making my dream come true right now. Wow. So I also got to talk about what I had the privilege of seeing you in both of these roles. Yes. In Hamilton. Yes. A little known musical name. Yeah, it's, it's, Hamilton. It's, it's trying. It's trying. It's trying to find a place. My friend. <laughs> It, it, it is an experience, and it, it's hard to even put into words. But I will say, that opening of Act Two. Oh yeah. You are throwing it down. That is one of my favorite moments. Um, tell me, tell me a little bit about that. What's funny is uh, I played both roles of the Marquis de Lafayette and Thomas Jefferson. Yes. And in uh, the first, uh, the first act, you know, I do guns and guns and ships, which is one of the fastest raps in the show, um, and jumping off a table and all that kind of stuff. But. My, my, I won't lie, I really, really, really enjoy doing what I miss. And it's because I, <laughs> people who know me know that I love Michael Jackson, MC Hammer, and Prince. Yes. And that first satin jacket I have on is this giant purple satin so jacket that hits the floor. And boy, I put that bad boy on with that ruffle shirt and I had a purple rain moment. <laughs> I was like, it was, I was, oh. I totally went back to the 80s. I was like, okay, James, keep it together, keep it together. Yes. And um, once you put the suit on, I knew how I wanted Thomas Jefferson to be. The great thing is uh, Tommy Kale, our director, he told me, he said, listen, man, we don't want you to be David Diggs. Cause, and David is fantastic. Yeah. One, of the, one, of, one of my good friends, he's also in Freestyle Love Supreme as well. Amazing. And one of the best rappers ever to put pen to paper, period. He's one of the best lyricists I've ever heard in my life. And he created this amazing dual role in Hamilton. And both he... David and Tommy told me, look, we don't want you to be David. We want you to be you. Bring your own swagger to it. And I said, yeah, but the fans know you and everything. He was like, they like, look, you stepped into Robin's shoes and yes. made them your own. Do the same thing here. So I put that, I literally was trying to find it, really trying to find it. And we were into rehearsals and I was finding little things, but I kid you not, the minute I put on the Lafayette jacket and the minute I put on the Jefferson jacket, I knew exactly who those two guys were. And once, once we opened up the second act and I came down those steps, it was all good. And I remember at the end of the show, he looks at me and he's like, dude, that's it. That's, that's <laughs> it. it. That, that's amazing. Okay, that's cool. So, and every, what the really cool thing about Hamilton is it, it, the, the, uh, the material sits so well on its own. All you need is a performer to believe in it and to go for it. There are several different companies in Hamilton now, Los Angeles, uh, New York, Chicago, and soon to be another tour, and also um, in uh, London. Each Jefferson Lafayette, each Hamilton, each Burr, each Washington, um, each Madison, each Lawrence Phillip, they're all different. They, n nobody plays it the same way, but the show still sits well on its own. But in my personal opinion, you know, Broadway's Broadway. And uh, we, we, have a, we, like have a, we have a slamming show. We have an amazing show. And the, our cast is fantastic from Javi to, to Mandy to Brian to Daniel Breaker to, to Anthony to Q. We have, um, I mean, oh, it, I mean it's, it's, it's ridiculous. It's, it is ridiculous. To Lexi, to, uh, to, jo, to, to jo, uh, Joanna, who's coming in, uh, we, it's, it's, trust me, it's, it's amazing. No review, no amount of word of mouth can do it justice when you're in that theater and the lights go down and it is just, it's, it's a spiritual experience. It's, it's, if you can get a ticket, maybe in 2019, right. yeah. but um, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. So you're, you're doing a great job, man. One other thing I gotta say, um, I know you're a big comic book fan. You yeah. mentioned earlier with the wrestling fan. And you know, in the comic books, sometimes they will bring in characters, you know, Batman versus Superman and bring it up. Well, yours truly 
<laughs> stepped into the shoes of the Grinch at one point in my career. Really? Yeah, you know, so I... Um, <clears throat> one of my I, favorite characters of all time. Yes, sir. <clears throat> I, I, I have done that. And I was like, you know what? I need to throw just a little Grinch moment at you. And perhaps the genie could just answer. Sure. So we'll see. I like it. <clears throat> Maybe my hearing is going. Or my head is broke. But it seemed to me, genie, it seemed you just spoke. <laughs> you know, the problem with you is, Grinch, is that you're really just way, 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 way too Grinchy. You need to get your life together. You need to stop being so green and be a little blue. You know, be a little happy, a little wishes, a little magic. What you need, guy, a makeover! You need a makeover. Oh. You need a makeover. That's what you need, kid. <laughs> Yes, sir. <laughs> I needed it. I said it said that back and forth. Uh, I can't thank you enough for coming today, man. I, I mean, can't thank you enough for doing like, the Grinch for me. Do you uh, understand I, I, how I, much I love? <laughs> I, 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 I would do that. I would. Do, I, I memorized the book, and I would do it for kids back when I was in college. Oh man, it's one of my my favorite uh, Dr. Seuss stories of all time. Mine and, and too, to be honest. My favorite one. We just had our moment. The genie and the oh, Grinch I love just it. met. Yeah, we could do that. That can, that can happen. We need to do a Christmas version of that. There we go. We just gave birth to that idea right here. <laughs> but listen, man, I, I can't thank you enough for coming and, and, and just rocking it out for me, showing thank you style much. and continued success to everything you're doing. You're really blazing a trail, my friend. And I just wanted to thank you. Well, thank you, Dan. I think what's, what I love about you is that you have such a sense of style and you have such a sense of grace and also you see the beauty in all shapes and all sizes. Yes, sir. You don't just bring what is quote unquote the beautiful people in, you bring beautiful people in. And I say thank you for that. Just got me. He's gonna, he's gonna end it like that. You gonna do that to me? <laughs> I'm sorry, bro, it's the truth. That's who this man is. It's, it's, it really is incredible. Thank you so much for your time, my friend. It's a pleasure. All right, listen, this isn't it. Show doesn't finish here, okay? We're coming at you next week just as strong, just as fierce, and just as fabulous. And let me tell you something. Every day in life, you're going to have a little voice in your head. There's going to be a moment, and it's going to say, oh, I don't know if you can do this. I don't think you can. You're going to have these uncomfortable moments. And I'm telling you, you got to push that out of the way, and you got to keep on going. People are going to have things to say. You know what? It's because maybe they're looking at themselves, and there's something they say, you know what? I wish I could be doing that. You don't know what's going on. So you know what? Worry about your side of the street. Keep living your dream, you keep going strong, and everything's gonna work out just fine. All right, see you next time.